Here are a few strange love letters. One, two, and some more. Sounds a little awkward, right? Like someone who writes them fell in love a little too much. Or like it's some kind of algorithm hides behind. As you can see, all of these love letters are signed by the same name, Mac. But Mac is not some kind of poetic person. Mac is not even a human. No surprise, it's an acronym for Manchester University Computer. These letters were generated on the Ferranti Mark I computer. This is one of the first commercially available electronic general-purpose stored program digital computers. The first prototype was built in 1948, but it certainly did not look like modern commercially available computers. It was a huge, heavy and astronomically expensive thing. In those times British electrical engineering firm Ferranti Limited sold it to universities, government facilities and big industrial companies. So Mark I was far far away from personal laptops we have right now. But why and where on one of the first computers in the world which was created for serious research work did the comic love letter generator come from? And how did it work? In our time, when so many technologies and devices have already been developed and so much code has been written, finding and reproducing one of the first computer text generators is almost an archaeological job. However, David Link did it. He holds an exhibition called Love Letters 1.0 in different cities. It shows a fully working replica of the same Ferranti Mark I computer. Here's what it looks like. David also managed to reproduce the original code of a letter generator on it. Almost 70 years later, Ferranti continues to give out strange love confessions with the Victorian era vibes. And, interestingly, it doesn't repeat itself. All letters look similar, but they are different. In another public space, a screen has been installed where the text of letters is displayed so that visitors can read them. And if the visitor manages to compose his or her name on the switches of a console using 5-bit code, a love letter will carry his signature. If I were a visitor to such an exhibition, I would hardly call a love letter generator an artificial intelligence. Today, even people who are far away from IT professions are surrounded by digital devices in literally every aspect of their lives. We have smart houses, smart light bulbs. Our smartphones can exchange jokes with us. Services like ChatGPT give us text that makes perfect sense. Midjourney and other neural networks draw pictures like real artists and generate photorealistic photos of people who don't exist in reality. And we are just okay with that. Dealing with smart devices is just another usual daily routine. It seems that along with the progress that goes on, there is an inflation of the term AI. For example, when people try to come up with the first definitions of artificial intelligence, roughly in generalized way, they sounded like this. This is a mechanism that can independently perform tasks that are accessible only to human intelligence. So, okay. Calculator. Before his invention, only a human could perform mathematical operations with the help of his human intellect. But the first mechanical adding machines appeared in the 19th century, electronic calculators in the 50s of the 20th century. They were 100 kilogram cabinets. I think calculators were immediately denied the title of AI. No, it's not about them at all. No one will seriously say that first Casio calculator was the first AI in the world. We think AI should do something more complicated. For example, to be able to play at least checkers with the person, or write lyrics that evoke romantic emotions in people. I don't know how people in the 50s reacted to love letter generator. Everyone who saw him then were scientists or engineers, but let's figure out who how and why did this program. Christopher Strachey. He was one of the founders of denotational semantics and a pioneer in programming language design. He is also was involved in development of CPL programming language, which is an acronym for Cambridge Programming Language or Combined Programming Language. 
CPL was also nicknamed as Cambridge plus London or Christopher's programming language. And later CPL led to B programming language and of course C. Christopher also worked with Alan Turing in Manchester University on one of the first computers in England. Strachey was born in 1916. His father Oliver was an intelligence officer during World War I and a cryptographer who worked with Alan Turing during World War II. Christopher's uncle was a famous writer, a member of Bloomsbury Group, a widely influential group of writers and artists living in Bloomsbury, London, along with Virginia Woolf, John Maynard Keynes and E. M. Forster. Despite being regarded as an exceptionally intelligent child, Christopher's academic performance as a student was unremarkable. During his time at King's College, Strachey first came in contact with Alan Turing, who was junior research fellow at university. In his third year at college, Christopher experienced a mental breakdown during his last two terms. His sister supposed it may have been coming to terms with his homosexuality. The time away from school was spent part partly in a residential home for psychotherapy. After the episode, Christo returned to complete his education, but his academic performance resulted in disappointed lower second classification, which dashed his hopes of pursuing a research studentship. Instead, he turned to education and spent his next 13 years as a schoolmaster in various educational institutions. Big changes happened in Christopher's life in January 1951 when he was introduced to Mike Woodger of National Physical Laboratory through a mutual friend. At the time, the NPL was one of three institutions in the UK engaged in computer construction, specifically the Pilot Ace, preliminary version of a full automatic computing engine, designed by Alan Turing. Inspired by his visit to the NPL, Christopher immediately began developing a program to enable the pilot Ace to play draughts checkers. In the following spring, Christopher learned about the Ferranti Mark I computer at the University of Manchester, which had a manual authored by Alan Turing. Through his earlier connections with Turing, Christopher obtained a copy of the manual and began the process of adapting his draughts program for the new machine. Christopher visited Turing in Manchester twice during the latter half of 1951, and on his second visit he was granted access to the Mark I to test his program. Through an intensive session that lasted from the evening to the early hours of the morning, Christopher achieved some success with the program. When it was completed, it concluded with a national anthem playing through the computer's sound device. In fact, during the visit Christopher programmed the Mark I to play several more songs. These compositions were captured for BBC Radio in the autumn of 1951 and are regarded as some of the earliest examples of computer-generated music. Notably, Christopher, a novice in this domain, programmed these tunes within a single evening. Love Letters were also the product of algorithmic generator that Strachey had written in his spare time. David Link, who got access to Christopher's archives, where he found algorithm well documented, described his execution in details. Apart from position comments like carriage return, line forward and spaces, the algorithm prints two salutations. When it enters a loop, which is carried out five times, and, depending on a random variable, follows one of two alternative paths. One generates a sentence following this synthetic skeleton. You are my adjective substantive. The other path gives my adjective substantive adverb verb your adjective substantive. Each phrase ends with a full stop. After the program leaves the loop, it closes with the ending yours adverb mug. The algorithm could produce several hundred million combinations, and therefore the letters seemed unique. The program, written in the spare time for fun, was one of the first examples of computer-generated literary text, and according to some, the first example of computer art. 
but can it be called the first example of artificial intelligence? Strachey wrote about this. A rather simple trick can produce an illusion that the computer is thinking. And these tricks can lead to quite unexpected and interesting results. So, our presentation of artificial intelligence is torn between two sides. A science fiction mechanism that is undistinguishable from human mind. And just a trick that causes an illusion. It seems to me that any program that is now considered AI, even the most advanced one, is still second for us. They are just tricks, the work of which can be explained, as any trick can be explained by sleight of hand and not by magic. But where is the line beyond which the trick will turn into real AI from science fiction? Alan Turing, Christopher Strachey and other computer scientists of the era were also science fiction dreamers, often talking about the future of artificial intelligence in their publications. For example, the famous and already pop-cultural Turing test, during which a computer that convinces a person that he is also a person can be considered artificial intelligence. The program that passed Turing test appeared in 1966. It was Joseph Weizenbaum's ELISA, an algorithm that responded to keywords and produced prepared answers. Joseph himself called it a parody of a psychotherapist who sees his client for the first time. Modern language models have stepped even further in this regard. Not only can they speak and write indistinguishably from a human, but, judging by the forecasts of analysts, they can replace people in intellectual and creative professions, which 20 years ago seemed to be the last to be automated. And anyway, all modern AI for us are tricks that create an illusion. The principles of your work can still be explained, sleight of hand and no magic. I'm very interested in what will happen next. Will we one day recognize the program as a fully-fledged AI without any compromises? Or the term will continue its inflation? And even more interesting, where can the path of refusing programs to be called artificial intelligence lead? Won't we one day have to admit that this is our intelligence, is just a trick, understandable and explainable? Thank you for watching, I uh, hope you liked this video. My name is Artem, I am not neural network and I am not a computer generated person, at least I hope so. And please check the website of Anywhere Club, aw.club. It's a digital platform for global community of IT professionals where you can find job opportunities, educational materials and any helpful tips and advice. Please check the description below and thank you for watching.